So, so far we have looked at how privacy enhancing technologies look from a legal standpoint, how auditing looks from a machine learning standpoint, and now we are going to have a look at what pragmatic implementation of these technologies looks in a highly regulated environments. Our next speaker is Stefano Braghin, who is at the IBM Research Center in Europe, and he is a senior research engineer and technical lead for data privacy. He has done extensive work at the Pennsylvania State University, University of Insubria, Nanyang Technological University, and the Digital Enterprise Research Institute for National University of Ireland. His research focuses on security and privacy for data and applications in distributed systems. Stefano. Thanks, Harvey. Thank you very much for having me, and uh, thanks, Jack and uh, Robert, for, for the kind invite. Um, I will echo a lot of the concepts that have been presented by the previous speakers, uh, trying to give a bit of hope to the complexity that uh, privacy regulations are giving us. First of all, the key takeaway from this talk is that uh, privacy is a good thing, it's increasing, it's pervasive in our lives, uh, and we need to uh, see it as a positive um, push to increase technology and increase uh, the way we, c we do analytics uh, on large data sets in a, in a conscious and ethical manner. Fully automated solution, unfortunately, regardless of what a lot of vendors um, are saying, it's not something that is feasible because it's very easy to take the wrong road uh, on when uh, trying to, ident to identify data, anonymize data. So naive solution will uh, lead very quickly to bad outcomes. Technology, fortunately, is here to help and uh, is uh, uh, increasing in, and uh, becoming more and more available. In fact, what I wanted to talk is specifically about that, so to go towards standardization from a slightly different perspective. As I was saying, data privacy is increasing. In 2020, Gartner predicted that 75% that, uh, of the population will be affected by some form of privacy regulation by 2024. And according to, the, uh, to what leading institutes like AIPP are observing, we are on track. We are actually a bit slightly ahead of that. Unfortunately, there are some issues with uh, the way these regulations are interpreted and can be translated into technology. And uh, to make things a bit worse is that when there are multiple countries that are trying to negotiate what are the key principles that are affecting their privacy regulations, it's complicated. As uh, Katarina was mentioning, there are several countries that have different terms to represent the same things in a slightly different manner that makes lawyers very unhappy. And I'm not a lawyer, fortunately. <laughs> but this is not a problem in the sense that uh, Yes, it's complicated to work on uh, uh, data that contains PI or PHI or even just sensitive data. So if something is important from a business point of view, it needs to be protected, regardless if it's an individual or the, the plan of, uh, of, uh, of a factory. It's something that needs to be protected. And the technology that can help in this type of protection is the same, regardless of the topic or the um, type of data that is being protected. This is creating issues when we want to be, uh, to be agile, as it's very required in, in, modern, uh, in modern business world. But at the same time, this is also pushing to have more quality in uh, the data that is shared, in the analytics that are, that are created, and uh, it's a good way to, to provide further leadership for specific companies that are investing in having an ethical and uh, regulatory compliant uh, set of techniques that are or technology that are exposed to their clients. This is even more complex because uh, when we talk about privacy, we don't know exactly where we apply privacy. The data flow, so where the data is collected from the user, passed to the controller, to the processor, to the consumer, there are so many places where data privacy can kick in with different type of technology, with different type of impact on the utility that the service that the consumer will receive will, uh, um, will be affected, and also the type of risk that is uh, implicitly 
available in the data, because the more we move the data to the consumer, the more we need to aggregate, the more it's easy to um, obtain a form of, uh, of data that can be exploited by an attacker. As Reza was mentioning, we can, have, we can expose a model and we can, there are techniques, uh, demonstrated techniques, to infer the data set on which it was trained. But it's the same if we have data moved from a controller to a processor and the processor is not uh, fully reliable. That's why there are a lot of issues from a regulatory point of view to not only use technology that is effective, but also to have an assessment of the various steps in the data flow pipeline in terms of what are the techniques that are used, what is the reliability of the partners that we work with. And this is a strong requirement uh, from a GDPR point of view in terms of uh, it's a component required by the data privacy impact assessment. Now, I kept mentioning about risk. And I need to make a clarification. When I talk about risk, I mean data risk. DPIA and other type of assessment cover several type of risks, most of which I'm not qualified to talk about. I can only talk about data privacy risk because it's the only thing that I'm, I'm doing research at the moment. And here we, we talk basically about the ability for an attacker to infer what type of, uh, who are the individuals represented in the data, where is the data coming from, and infer additional information by what we explicitly want the attacker to know, or what we, what we are willing to share from a risk assessment point of view. To put things a bit more in perspective, GDPR gives us uh, three main uh, definitions in terms of what needs to be protected, what are the type of attacks that need to be, to be taken care of. And fortunately, GDPR, do, did, the team did working on GDPR did an amazing job generalizing enough uh, this concept so that uh, if someone is, compli is compliant and able to protect against these attacks, uh, there are good chances that they are compliant with other regulations, for example, CCPA, for example, the uh, new regulation from Canada, and so on and so forth. This is not everything, I know, but it's a good start. If we're able to protect again from these things, we can, uh, we can say that we have a, we performed our due diligence uh, to process the data in a compliant manner, in a, in a, in a risk-adverse manner. For that, uh, I want to go the other way. Instead of standardizing from a community point of view, let's go from a technology point of view. To do that, uh, we are working heavily to release open source technology that can be used to perform a back on the envelope assessment and to start seeing how various techniques of data protection impact the utility of, uh, of the various models that can be trained, of the analytics that we want to run, or even just the quality of the data that, uh, that we want to use. This is an example. This is not the only uh, technology available, but we worked on it for several years, and uh, we think that it's, uh, it's a good enough example to start uh, a conversation. This tool and other similar to that perform various types of privacy threats assessment. And, uh, Basically, they cover the entire landscape. These um, five, um, five, yes, five <laughs> possible assessments are basically um, examples of uh, how an attacker can, be, uh, can observe and infer information from the data depending on where in the data processing pipeline the data is residing. Would it be directly identifiable data, which means data that resides in our, in our databases, data that is in public data sets? Or we can use attack against anonymized data. And excuse me for using anonymized instead of student anonymized. This is from a, a, a computer science paper. Or how this anonymized or direct identifier data links with external data set. Because the big issue is that uh, the velocity with which uh, new data sets are released is astonishing. And uh, the more data is available, the more linkable data is available in the wild, the easier it is for an attacker to break any type of anonymization that can be, um, can be applied to the data, as long as there is some residual utility. And this is a point. Uh, the data that is anonymized or pseudonymized can be re-identified, given enough data and enough intrinsic utility. Other techniques to prevent that exist, for example, the trusted execution environment, multi-party computation that hide 
the data that is being that is processed, but we have ways to access this data that is basically using the, the, the services that are exposing the data or receiving a recommendation from a recommender system or from Google, for example. Which means that we need to, to be able to perform trivial tasks in a way, like being able to understand the data that we have in terms of what are the sensitive data that are available, what are the sensitive features that are, that are in our data sets. And uh, although this seems trivial, it's not when we think about big data. It's not when the volume and the velocity in which data is generated is not something that a human can handle. We need ways, te technology, to help highlighted to the user where could be some issues, which means that we need techniques like what we have here, that is simply data, data type identification, to highlight which portions of the data that we have might have issues, regardless of what we assume a priori. Because we have seen in too many interactions with clients, with data cataloging done manually, so they receive a data set from a third party. They say this column is, uh, the, co the name of this column is comment. It will contain some comments. No, it contains credit card numbers. But this is only the first step. Second step is also to try to identify what are the statistical properties of the data set that we are, that we are observing, which basically means to use, again, technology, to use machines to identify what are combination of columns that might lead to identification. Basically, to find what can be used by an attacker to link the data that we have with the external data set. And this is done all internally. This is done on the data that we own. We are not even talking about uh, um, exploring the internet to find uh, a random data set on, uh, on, uh, on a remote website. This can be done locally. This has been proven to, be, to work. And this is basically the base of uh, K-anonymity, so an, a very old technique. But it's not used, unfortunately. Second step is also to, to go the next level to try to understand what uh, we expose, what makes sense to expose in the data that we have. Because if we have a data set, let's say the one on the left, and uh, we apply some transformation, we are still able to re-identify the content, regardless of, uh, of the type of transformation that we do, depending on the nature of the data. Uh, most of the anonymization techniques, specifically the one developed in the 90s of, of early 2000s, were designed for census data. They work very well with census data. They don't work with transactional, transactional data. So if we have credit card transactions, if we have uh, um, registries of uh, admission and discharge from hospitals, they don't work. Because the type of data that uh, is represented there, it's easier to link. We need other techniques to, pr to protect from that. These techniques exist, and uh, there are several available in, in the world. There are, the toolkit that I presented before is not the only one. I can name several if you, if you want. Uh, but basically provide even general techniques to transform the data in a way that makes it harder for an attacker to, uh, to identify what the data that is contained, while at the same try time trying to protect some utility, because that's the key point. We can make the data completely unidentifiable, but the data will be useless. We need to find the right balance between what are the business requirements, what are the regulatory requirements. In most cases, they're not clear. It's just a matter of doing something so that we can have some, we can sleep at night, basically. These are some techniques. Some of them are old, some of them are very old, like suppression, for example, but they are still a first step toward uh, uh, being able to, uh, to provide uh, this type of leadership in, uh, in the privacy world. This is not limited only to tabular data, because uh, right now we have uh, new types of data, unstructured, video, audio. All these type of data will contain some form of risk when they are released or when they are used in uh, other types of, uh, of application. The same techniques or variation of the same techniques can, just, can be applied to uh, this other type of, uh, of data. Would it be notes, uh, medical notes, uh, images, uh, and so on and so forth? Now, one would ask, why do we need to 
go all through, these pro through all these processes to anonymize our data? Why don't we use just synthetic data? Synthetic data is brilliant. It, it's a way to expose data that we want to train a model on without releasing the real data. But the quality of the data that is, pro that is created depends heavily on the techniques that have been used to create the generator of the data. And synthetic data is not a new concept. It has been used in, for years, even for just testing application. If we want to test an application, we want to see if it works with the input that it expects. And when we develop a new application, we don't use the real data. We use synthetic data. The problem is that this, that data has been created specifically for testing, not for model training. If we want to use model training, we need to use higher quality, which means intrinsically similar to the original data, which means might contain some private information still. And also, if we use generative technology, as Reza was mentioning, a model trained on private data, according to GDPR, is still personal data. So there is this, this other, another issue. Another technique that is very popular to try to handle this is using federated learning. Instead of releasing the data, I release insights. We have the same problem with additional issues, because uh, the, foundation, the fundamental assumption of federated learning is that we trust the parties involved. We trust the clients, we trust our peers, we trust the aggregators. This is not always the case. And uh, we have techniques uh, to perform federated learning. We have techniques to perform federated learning in a trusted environment. There are techniques uh, to perform uh, privacy preserving federated learning, basically going the next step uh, using some um, multi-party computational cryptographic techniques uh, to enhance the, uh, the, to reduce the risk that the, uh, someone can infer the data that is, uh, that is owned by the various clients, but we still trust clients aggregator. We developed also and released publicly techniques uh, to prevent that. So basically to provide assurances that clients and aggregator are behaving according to the, con to the social contracts or even legal contract that has been established to, to decide to run federated learning. So far I talked about traditional techniques or things that, are used, that were used in the past and that uh, according to modern standards are not the state of the art, but they are still useful in practice and in a lot of scenarios. Differential privacy, it's a totally different, uh, um, it's the game changer in this, uh, in this context. Differential privacy is actually the way to provide some mathematical guarantees that the data is private, given some assumptions. The problem is that differential privacy has been proven to be heavy from the utility point of view. And uh, something that I want as a giveaway from, take away from this slide is the epsilon value because it took me forever to understand how it works because epsilon works the opposite that you would think. Epsilon means the smaller the epsilon, the more privacy. That, that was complicated for me. We can uh, try various values of epsilon on our data, but we still need a way to test it in practice because, as I said, using differential privacy is very expensive from a utility point of view, although it's very good from a privacy point of view. But fortunately, we have tools to try in practice, and these are, again, publicly available. Uh, for example, DiffPrivLib is a library that was developed by a colleague in, uh, in my lab, and uh, it's possible to use it in any analytic that is currently being used. But if you want to know more, please join the workshop tomorrow. <laughs> And the last thing that I wanted to, to talk about is the thing that no one talked about, talks about uh, with respect to GDPR, that is uh, the right to be forgotten. Everyone uh, know that we, we know, all know that we share data and companies are using our data to train models. Federated learning is one way to train a model in a more privacy-preserving manner. But what happens if I want to withdraw the consent for the data that I was used? There are several issues with that because the standard approach is to retrain the model. This is not feasible in federated learning because most likely the data doesn't exist anymore. And this is very common in the medical domain where after I use the data, I need to destroy it by law. If you don't, other type of troubles. 
The naive solution, as I said, is just to remove and uh, start. It doesn't work. But it's possible to unlearn, so basically to teach a model how to forget that a certain, uh, a certain individual exists, that a certain data point exists. And before you think, now this is science fiction, it's not. Uh, actually, a colleague of mine that is in the audience uh, is leading the effort on, uh, on this work, uh, where we demonstrated that federated null learning actually works and uh, gives some results. Is it perfect? No, but it's a step forward. So to recap, uh, data privacy is good. Data privacy is here. It won't go away, for sure. We need to think very careful about the solutions that we want to use because they are use case driven, data driven, and business requirement driven. If, depending on the domain in which we are, we are, we will have different requirements. We will have uh, different requirements not only from the regulatory point of view, but the type, the quality of service that we want to provide to our clients. As I said, fully automated solution, it's nice, uh, but I spent the last eight years trying to build one, doesn't work because we want human in the loop. We need someone that is able to understand the law, that is able to translate the law in actions to make a decision, to make a call on what makes sense from a regulatory, compliance, and business point of view. I have nine minutes for questions if you want. <laughs> I can go away. I'm happy both cases. If you just raise your hand, I'll bring you the microphone. And we are hiding. Hello. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I have, so I have a question regarding the federated unlearning. Yes. So you, you have mentioned that you know, we, the problem arises because we have erased the individual data points, so we cannot afford retraining without them. Uh, however, in order to know, you know what to remove from the model, so how do we remove data points that we have erased? <laughs> do we still like, reproduce copies from the uh, customers or like from the users that want to be removed from the database, or is there an alternative way? There, uh, it's a mix of both. So in some cases, we can regenerate the data point because uh, someone that we draw consent uh, has the data somewhere or a characterization of the data that they want to be removed. In some cases, when I say the data needs to be removed, it means that the clients that were involved in the federated learning process will need to remove their data. But in a lot of cases, the data is available somewhere for historical reasons. For example, if you have, uh, if you're training a model for medical purposes, the hospital will give the data to a third party that will train the model, most likely a pharmaceutical company that will run uh, in uh, each hospital in an isolated environment to train the global model. But the data still resides in the hospital databases because they need to know your, patient, your history, basically. And we can reconstruct what was used. Um, alternatively, there are other techniques uh, to basically measure what we assume is the shape of the data that you want removed and measure if it's still within the data, if, uh, that, if the training with that data point happened too far, too far in the past. Because as we know, model evolves uh, and they, they might lose some memory about the data. Um, if you want to follow up, please reach out. Uh, I'll give you all the pointers in terms of papers as well. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Um, so first of all, thank you for the amazing talk. And I actually have a very open-end question. So Google um, recently published their machine unlearning challenge. Yes. So how does that fit in with the federated unlearning differences, similarities? Is it, is it the same thing, or is it then machine learning in general? I haven't read the call specifically. Uh, as far as I understood, it's a machine, machine unlearning in general. We focus more on the federated setting 
because that's what, uh, what we worked on mostly. Uh, the techniques that are used uh, in traditional uh, federated unlearning, sorry, the techniques that are used in machine unlearning can translate to federated unlearning with the issue that federated unlearning is slightly more complicated to, to do because we don't have a centralized data set and one party that is training a model, but we have multiple parties, which basically means the model that is trained might contain some uh, noise uh, because of the way it was trained. And that uh, might, at the same time, make it easier to unlearn because we might, the model might have learned less uh, the specifics of the data, while at the same time it's harder to prove that we unlearn the actual data point because of, of this noise that is introduced in the training process. And just a, a note, uh, I wasn't referring to federated learning using differential privacy as well, because that's a different, uh, different beast altogether. Kindly, when you say your question, please stand up so we can immortalize you on video. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks very much. I have a kind of IBM-specific question for you. So um, you, me you mentioned the Data Privacy Toolkit. Yes, sir. And I would just like to know, um, the team behind that, do they talk at all with the team behind the AI Fairness 360 Toolkit? Yes, we do. Yeah. And the team behind the Data Privacy Toolkit uh, is myself and some colleagues in the audience. And uh, yeah, the difference between the AI360 toolkit is that they look more at the model, we look at the data. So basically, we are two components that operate at different stages of the, of the data flow that I presented before. Mm -hmm. we, um, the toolkit was originally created to satisfy HIPAA and then adapted to, uh, to GDPR. In HIPAA, model privacy is not a thing. It's more the data that is going to be released when once the data has been released, nobody cares. Don't quote me on that, please. <laughs> um, and uh, basically, what we do is to try to reduce the privacy risk in the data before it's shared or before it's used in uh, the data processing. If uh, you think also about data minimization that AI360 does, it's complementary to what we do. We do data transformation, not data minimization in terms of suppressing columns or compressing uh, the, the dimensions that are available. So we don't do PCA. We remove the data values, or either through masking, anonymization, tokenization, et cetera, or we generalize them. And the way the generalization is performed, if one uses, um, for example, okay, anonymity or variance or differential privacy, is done in a way that is still, the data is still uh, satisfying the shape and uh, taxonomy that were originally uh, observed in the data. So the model trained after is still going to perform decently for a given definition of decently because we removed information. Thanks very much. I'll come and get some contact information. Please. Later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. Thank I you. Think we're done. And yes. let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>